Hey, happy Thanksgiving weekend. I'm Jade, and we are on location at the art house today. I'm here with my friends Emily, Ellie, Emery, and Kristen, and we are making some Christmas goodies because Thanksgiving's over and Christmas mode is in full swing for us. So, I wanted to tell you guys a little bit about what's coming this week for Public Church. It's coming Thursday, December 2nd, is the return of Drumroll, please. Kramer's Corner. Yes. If you guys don't know what this is, this is a time for our college students to come and cram, not just in corners, but for finals. It's gonna be from 8 p.m. until 2 a.m. We are sacrificing this for you guys. You can study anywhere in the building, have snacks, and there's also gonna be a meal time at nine o'clock in the annex. What's that meal gonna be, guys? Omelets. Omelets. We're gonna have all kinds of breakfast food because Pastor Todd loves omelets. And then Saturday, December 4th, we have a special opportunity for the ladies. We're gonna be partnering with For The One Ministries that helps support local adoptive and foster families. So Kristen, do you ever have nights where you just don't have time to make dinner? All the time. Yeah, so we wanna help these families by coming alongside them and making freezer meals so they can just pop those in the oven those nights so they get super crazy and stressed for them. And finally on Sunday, December 5th, is the long-awaited return of one of our favorite events. Christmas Spectacular. Yeah! Yes. <laughs> this is going to be in all three gatherings, and the point of this is just to bring in some holiday cheer together as a family. We're going to hear the Christmas stories, sing Christmas songs, and see some acts from a few of our different public church family members. And the big thing is, we want you to wear your Christmas attire. Yes. So that's what's going on at public church this week. And all of this is made possible because of your generosity. So thank you, church. And today, as we transition into a time of giving, you'll see multiple ways you can do that on the screen. But I want to give you a thought to consider. What is your favorite holiday treat? Mmm, Buckeyes for me. Mmm, chocolate pie. And cinnamon rolls. <laughs> or mine. Ooh, cinnamon rolls, you heard that. Peanut yeah. butter pie. Mm. Ooh. Mmm, peanut butter pie. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, online family. It is so good to be with you guys today. I just wanna say a shout out to Brian and Betsy, to Luke and Henry and Hannah, and also to baby Kyson who was just born. Congratulations to Bryce and Caroline and Reese. And these are just a few of you guys in our online family whom we know. And if we don't know you, we would love to know you. So my name is Todd, if we haven't met, and if you would email katie at publicchurch.com, we'd love to send you a gift and we'd love to connect with you. You know, as I've thought about my life, my time with Dr. Walmack has literally changed the trajectory of my life. You know, Dr. Walmack is my counselor. And when I came to him, I knew that I didn't like the direction my life was going, but I didn't know how to change that direction. I knew I was going towards ruin, but I didn't know how to get off that path. And Jesus used him to give me tools to, to get off that path. And one of those tools and something he taught me that has just been burned in my mind is that I need to pursue health in four areas, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. And so he helped me find tools and, and find what that looked like for me to, to pursue health in the areas of mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual. And so what we want to talk about today on this Thanksgiving weekend, happy Thanksgiving, by the way, is we want to talk about mental and spiritual health. We're mostly talking about mental health, but as Jesus followers, like spiritual health is a component of that. And if you don't follow Jesus, I am fired up that you are watching this because we want you to understand that Jesus cares about our mental, spiritual, emotional, and physical health. He just simply loves us, and that's all of us. So if nobody's told you that, I think you're going to see today that God's Word speaks to our mental health, and Jesus cares about our mental health. We're specifically going to talk about two areas of mental health, or really two struggles within the mental health arena, which are anxiety and worry. Now you do a quick Google search and, and have some definitions of those and, and, and they're different, but they're related and really they're plaguing us. Anxiety and worry affect all, if not most of us, or excuse me, most, if not all of us. I mean, I'm just wondering, when's the last time that you've lost sleep because of anxiety? When's the last time that you've been unable to focus at work or 
in my opinion, even worse, unable to focus with your family because of anxiety. Parents, when's the last time you were playing with your kids and some kind of worry was just playing in your minds and you hear dada or mama and it takes them about three times to get your attention because you're over here in worry land and they just want you to play Legos with them. You know, this, this affects us. And, and the reality is if we don't address these two areas, if we allow anxiety and worry to run unchecked, then that will greatly affect the quality and the direction of our lives. Now, as we have this conversation, I wanna be super clear. I am not a counselor, but I've definitely been shaped by counseling and by counselors. And from the top, I wanna point you to two conversations that we've had, because this is not the first time that that we have gone here. And in fact, this is just part of our culture to have conversations like this. Um, But if you go all the way back to the very last gathering of 2020, you can see a conversation that I had with Cindy Bowler, a leader in our church, um, a licensed social worker who does a lot of counseling. I mean, she is phenomenal about rest and mental health. And then this summer in 2021, um, I had a conversation with Steve and Kelly Knapp, two licensed counselors about mental and emotional health. And I would highly encourage you to go on our YouTube channel, go to our podcast and either watch or listen to those. And what we're gonna see today is that God speaks to this. And the thing about worry and anxiety, I think because it's so prevalent in in our current world that we can think it's a modern issue. But the reality is that anxiety was rampant in the ancient world. And, And here was one of the big root causes of anxiety in the ancient world is they were concerned that the gods were gonna get them. Like there were so many different gods and they had to please these gods in in very particular ways. So man, if if I forget this or if I don't acknowledge this God, then is this God going to get me? And and what bad thing is looming around the corner? So anxiety was quite simply just part of the fabric of the ancient world, very similar to how it's just part of the fabric of our world. And we're going to be in Philippians chapter four. So if you want to go there in your Bible or Bible app, But from what Paul writes here, and he's the author, he was a leader in the early Jesus movement. What Paul writes to the church at Philippi, it's very clear that that here's some issues they were facing. Anxiety, worry, depression, a lack of taking prayer seriously. It also sounds like our modern world, doesn't it? And so know that as we look at this, again, we are diving into God's word. We're talking about mental and spiritual health. But, but we believe wholeheartedly that depression is a disease and it needs to be treated like that. So today is not all that you need. In fact, I hope that today drives you towards counseling, drives you to seek medical help if you're struggling under the weight of a disease like depression. And for all of us, I hope that today helps us begin to push back and fight against the worry and anxiety that's really just running rampant in our world and quite frankly, often in our own minds. So before we go to this text, let's just pray and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us. So Jesus, thank you for the relevance of your word. I pray for the people watching who who don't know you, that they would just see how much you care about this and that they would see the relevance of these words written 2,000 years ago that could have been written yesterday and published in a uh, medical article yesterday. I mean, they're so relevant. And so speak to us, challenge us and change us through this and and show us how through your power, Jesus, that we can fight against anxiety and worry. Holy Spirit, go before me, move through me and go behind me and show us how to live this out. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So a little bit of context before we read verses four, four through, um, chapter four, verses four, four through nine. Um, In Philippians chapter two, verse five, Paul says this. He says, have the same attitude or mindset of Jesus. And in Philippians 3.15, he says, hey, this is what it means to be mature in how you think about these things. So those aren't just verses at those points in the letter. Those are themes that Paul is weaving in. So what he wants us to see here is what it means to have a mature Christ-like mindset towards worry and anxiety. And what we're going to do is we're going to read this all together. And I really just want to let you into uh, Whitney's and my living room, because as we do our bedtime routine every night, these are Oliver's, who's our youngest child. These are his life verses. So we say that his name means ambassador of peace. You know, Oliver comes from like the olive branch. And so 
He's our ambassador's peace. And so these are verses that we say over him and Liam together as they're drinking their milk every single night. And so I just want to challenge you from the top, memorize these. Like let God's word get so rooted in your heart and your soul that it can affect you without having to open up your YouVersion Bible app or grab a hard copy of the Bible. So here we go. Philippians 4, 4 through 9. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let your reasonableness, ah, take me a second. I'm going to back up because I say this every night. So I believe I can do it. All right. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see how considerate you are. Remember, the Lord is near. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace that exceeds everything, any, that exceeds anything we could understand. His peace will guard our hearts and minds as we live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable. And wow, I, I really do say this every night. Let me make sure I got this right. Pure. Uh, true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard and saw in me, and the God of peace will be with you. So as you can see, as you memorize, sometimes you're going to be imperfect in that. That is okay. We're still hiding God's word in our heart. So first, Paul says something in verse four. He says, always be full of joy in the Lord. Now, it's important to keep the context of the letter. He's saying, hey, here's the mindset of Christ when it comes to, to worry and anxiety. But also, we need to know what he says right before this in chapter four. Right before this, he says, hey, guys, we'll let you know there's these two ladies. Love them a lot. We have done a lot of great works and ministry together. But guys, they are fighting. They're in disunity. Can you work that out? So basically, as you're trying to help these ladies resolve their fight, rejoice always. Oh, by the way, um, I'm in prison because Paul's in prison as he writes this. So rejoice always. <laughs> Maybe in addition to reading this, we should also spend some time this next week reading verses 11 through 13, where Paul talks about how he's learned to be content in everything when he's dealing with this unity, when he's in prison. And so Paul says, hey, rejoice always in Jesus. Another translation could be publicly celebrate Jesus. In this time period, there are all kinds of public celebrations of their gods and of their big God, Caesar. And so he said, hey, can't Jesus followers celebrate the one true God whose name is Jesus? Let's publicly celebrate Jesus always. Which if you're struggling right now, could feel kind of insulting, honestly. And I think we have to point out attention that um, a great friend of mine, Matt Moore, pointed out in community group one night that, yes, this verse says rejoice always, but there's also an entire book of the Bible called Lamentations. And so lament means to sit in the pain rather than rush through the pain. So what Paul is not saying is have a pie in the sky, everything's good outlook. What he is saying is that we can find joy in the journey, no matter how bad the journey. Why? Because our joy isn't rooted in our circumstances. Our joy is rooted in a person. Our joy is rooted in Jesus. That's why it says rejoice in the Lord, publicly celebrate in Jesus always. Again, I say rejoice. And then he says this, let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. The, the Greek word actually is best translated magnanimity. You're not going to find that in your translation because it's like, what in the world does that mean? What, what it's talking about is a generous attitude towards others, that, that you actually give people more than they deserve, even when they don't deserve it. Here, here's how we say it in our culture. It means being for people that we leverage our influence to benefit others. And so what he says here is let everyone see, in other words, in your, in your everyday lives, in your sphere of influence, let it be evident that you are for people. Pause. So far, Paul has said, hey, 
let's publicly celebrate in Jesus. Let, let's find joy in Jesus in the good times and the bad. And by the way, let's be for people even when they're not for you. Um, so basically he said, let's just do two impossible things. Come on, Paul. How in the world do we do this? I think he would say, um, if you just want to keep reading, I didn't stop there. And he says, remember, the Lord is near. Now, this word in Greek is really ambiguous. There's two meanings. It means that Jesus is coming back and he could come back any time. Like, like his return is near. His return when he will restore all things and, and make everything right. But it also means that God is literally near. That, that Jesus is right here among us. And, and even if you don't follow him, man, he's, he's like, he's near. He's not far away. You don't have to run. You take one step and he will meet you there. It reminds me of something James wrote in James chapter four, verse eight, where he says this, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Or in this translation I'm reading, come close to God and God will come close to you. Wow, that's so amazing. But then we should keep reading because uh, right before that, the whole theme is humility. So saying, if we're going to draw near to God, uh, humility is key. <laughs> that we, that's essential for drawing near to God. And then he says, um, so wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he'll, he will lift you up in honor. And some of you are like, and that's why I don't believe the Bible because it contradicts itself. Paul says, rejoice always. James says, let gloom replace joy. No, it's not a contradiction. It's a tension. Here's what Paul and James are saying together. Saying, look, we can have deep seated joy even as we're repenting and lamenting. Really? That, that, that we can have deep-seated joy and we can have deep-seated sorrow and lamenting at our sin and how bad we are and how far from God we are. This is the paradox of following Jesus. How in the world can we both have joy inside of us and lament at the same time? How in the world can we have joy and have sorrow at the same time? <laughs> it's the suffering of the cross and it's the hope of the resurrection. This is our story as Jesus followers, that we are saved, forgiven of our sins, restored to right, right relationship with God through the suffering of the cross. And we can find hope in any situation. We can know that John 1, 5 says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness will never extinguish it. And we can know that Jesus says he's the light. So that means Jesus shines in the darkness and the darkness will never overcome or extinguish him. Why? Because he rose from the dead. How in the world do we hold this tension? We hold it just like we hold the tension of the God who suffers and the God who rose. And so there's a song that I would encourage you to listen to this week. It's called Son of Suffering. You can just look it up. And it is just this incredible song about the God who weeps, the God who has suffered for us. And Paul puts this in here, that God is near. And I think the Holy Spirit knew that James was going to write, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And he knew that there was going to be this seeming contradiction that's actually a tension because the Holy Spirit wants us to know that we can't live this out. We can't fight worry and anxiety except through the power of the cross and the resurrection. So we're actually going to take communion. And so I just want to encourage you right now to press pause for just a moment. And just to go get something, whether it's some bread and juice or what, whatever you have in your home, just to, to grab communion and then come back. And before we go on, we just want to remember what Jesus has done. See, as we take the bread, we remember that the Son of God suffered for us. That He literally 
gave his very body, that he bled and died, even though he had never sinned, he, he took on our sin. And so Jesus, as we take this bread, we remember your body broken for us. And now as we take the cup, we remember his blood spilled for us. We remember that in Hebrews it says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. That he had to die so that we could experience life. Life that is only found through relationship with God. So Jesus, we are so thankful for your sacrifice and your blood that cleanses us. Thank you, Jesus. And may we always come to this passage and see the suffering of the cross and the hope of the resurrection. It's in Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen. So now as we continue, in verse 6, Paul says, So don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. And I, I think it's vital. We don't separate verse 5 from verse 6. Paul's saying, we don't worry and we pray because Jesus is near. <laughs> because Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the dead. Like, I personally don't think that verses 6 and 7 could have been written. At least they wouldn't have made logical sense before the resurrection. How do you not worry? How in the world can you push back against anxiety? Because some translations say, be anxious for nothing. Only because you know that Jesus suffered and then he conquered. And so it says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. I don't know about you, but so often I'll tell a whole lot of other people what I need before I tell God what I need. And our Father in heaven is saying, run to me. I am near. I, I can handle it. Something I read as I was studying in a commentary said, if it matters to God, it matters. Excuse me, if it matters to us, it matters to God. Like, like He cares. And so the way that we fight anxiety, the way that we fight worry, is we release anxiety through prayer. We release worry through prayer. Remember, this is kind of like a beginner's guide. Like we're not going into the full counseling session. See a counselor for that. But from a biblical perspective, a, a huge and irreplaceable part of fighting against anxiety and worry is prayer. It's coming to God and saying, God, I am consumed with this. God, this is ruining me. God, I can't focus. God, I, I'm losing sleep. And I just want to put this before your feet because you care about me. See, prayer is one of the antidotes to worry. And then he says this, and thank him. Thank him for all he's done. See, psychologically, gratitude displaces worry. Gratefulness displaces um, anxiety. Like it's, it's physically impossible for us to be grateful and filled with anxiety, to be grateful and worried at the same time. So what Paul is saying is, as we're praying and pouring out our hearts to God, take some moments and remember that you're praying to the God who suffered and you're praying to the God who rose. Thank Him for all He has done. And what an opportunity we have, knowing that He's right there with us. And he says, then you're going to experience God's peace, this ability to understand that in the chaos of life, God's got this. When I read this idea about God's peace that exceeds anything we can understand, I really think about athletes. I think about these athletes who, the fans, they're on the edge of their seat or they're worried or they're pacing. And these athletes, they just, I'm good. And the attitude that I see in these athletes is, I've trained for this, so I've got this. Like all you fans, you've not been at practice. You've not seen what I've done. You haven't seen the off-season workouts. Like you're so worried, but I've trained for this. I've got this. 
And what Paul's saying is that we should have this attitude. I've prayed for this. God's got this. <laughs> it's not on me. This is on God. I have prayed about this. I have put this before my heavenly father. I I've put it at the feet of Jesus. I've prayed for this. God's got this. And so as we pray and put these things before his feet, we're going to experience his peace. And it says that his peace will guard our hearts and our minds. Philippi was a military town. So they would have understood this language. Paul was talking about basically an army surrounding a city. And so what he's saying is that the peace of God is like an army that surrounds our mind and surrounds our hearts and fights off worry and fights off anxiety. Paul is not saying that we're not going to worry. Paul's not saying that we're never going to have anxiety. In fact, and, and just to be clear, Paul's not saying that if you're a Jesus follower, you won't battle anxiety. No, no, no. He's writing this because Jesus followers were facing anxiety. Like he's writing this because Jesus followers were struggling with worry. This is part of the struggle. But what he is saying is that we can fight against it. And there can be moments from the outside, it would look like we should be drowning in either worry or anxiety. And yet we're actually being guarded from that by the peace of God. As God himself fights for us and fends off, he fends off worry, he fends off anxiety. And when I read this, I think about Colossians 3.15 that says, let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. <laughs> I think about in Ephesians chapter 2 where it says, for he himself, for Jesus is our peace. That's the God we're talking about. And, and I want to be clear about this. Um, know that all this is found in Christ Jesus. So if you don't follow Jesus, do you want to follow him? He's the God who suffers, and he's the God who rose. And, and do you want to give your life to Jesus who suffered for you and conquered death for you and gives you a path towards overcoming the anxiety and, and worry that may be plaguing your life today? Not that you're not going to struggle, but he's with you in it and give you tools to fight against it. So if you want to follow Jesus, just tell him. I believe you died and rose again, and I want to surrender to you. If you have any questions about that, email katie at publicchurch.com. And then he, said, he writes verse 8. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts. He says, all right, as we're getting worry out of the way, as, as we're pushing anxiety out of our minds, as, as the peace of God is literally guarding us against these things, then here's what we do need to focus on. If I, when I read this verse, I think about something that, that Johnny McDaniel said when he was the superintendent and I worked for him. He said, um, find the good and praise it. It's what Paul's saying here. Hey, fix your thoughts on what's true and honorable, what is right and pure and lovely and admirable. If there's anything excellent, if there's anything worthy of praise, then think about, then focus on these things. Paul's saying too often worry takes us captive. He's saying, no, no, change that and you take your thoughts captive. Why can we take our thoughts captive? Because we're empowered by the spirit that rose Jesus from the dead. <laughs> That's why we can do this. So then we got to think about what we are letting in our minds and what we are letting dwell and sit in our minds. Sometimes we get a thought and we can't control that thought coming into our mind. But we can control whether we let it stay there, whether you take it captive and send it out. That, that's literally what Whitney does. He, she does this motion of, ah, I'm getting that out. And that's what we have to do. We've got to take our thoughts captive. Jesus gives us the power to do that. And I just want to say, maybe that's part of your homework from this. I don't know exactly how you're wired and how God's made you, but, but he does. And he's put people in your life that can help you come up with a battle plan to take your thoughts captive. So maybe your homework is to pray, to get in the word, and then to ask a Jesus follower you trust. Hey, help me figure out what it means to take my thoughts captive and to fix my mind on what's true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Because worry ain't got no room when our minds are filled with these things. And then I love verse nine. It's like public church's vision because he's saying, hey, this isn't just theoretical. We're not just talking about this in a Sunday gathering. No, he's saying, hey, do this. Keep putting into practice 
all that you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, which is unbelievable that Paul says, hey, I'm not perfect, but I've been doing my best to model this and live this out. That's discipleship, by the way, that when we mess up, we own it. We're authentic about it, but our lives should be an example. What we're saying and how we're living should align and match. And so Paul's saying, now, keep putting into practice these things and know this, that as you do, the God of peace will be with you that we don't just get the peace of God, we get the presence of God, that He is with us. Back to verse 5. Jesus is near. So here's how this has been playing out in my life. From Philippians chapter 4, really verses 11 through 13, several years ago, God gave me this phrase of control the controllables. It's been in my office ever since. The problem is I've been struggling with that and... The problem I realized, so I've been struggling with that to back up, and the problem is that I've not been defining the controllables. So in this season, really like quarter four of this year, this was something that that the Holy Spirit showed me, is that I need to define the controllable and release the uncontrollables. I need to take some time to define, hey, what exactly can I control? Because sometimes it's like, well, if I would have this conversation, then that's gone. So I have the conversation. And sometimes it's like, well, you know what? If... No matter what I do, I can't touch this. This is a Jesus thing. It's an uncontrollable. So I need to release that. And so how do I release it? Through prayer. And what does it look like for me to put this into practice? Because if I'm not defining the controllable and releasing the uncontrollable, man, worry is going to be up in here in my mind. And so I actually started running every other week with Jason Cox. He was my student pastor, great friend, still consider him a mentor type figure in my life and say, Jason, I don't care what else we talk about. I want you to ask me, am I defining the controllable? Am I releasing the uncontrollable? And let's talk about it. And it has been phenomenal having that accountability on a run every other week. So that's how Jesus is changing me in this. That's how I'm able to put this into practice like over and over again. Because it's an ongoing battle for me. So the question to end with is, what do you need to practice? (laughs) From this incredible passage, what do you need to keep putting into practice? Not like, hey, on Tuesday, I'm going to do this one time. I got it. No, no, no. It's going to be like Tuesday and Wednesday and the next Tuesday and the next Tuesday. So what do you need to keep putting into practice? And one specific thing, if, if, if you're not in the Word, We can't do this. And that's one of the reasons I'm fired up that today we are releasing our Knowing Jesus Project for Luke. The Knowing Jesus Project is the reality that we want everyone to know Jesus. And we don't want you to just hear what me or someone else says about Jesus. We want you to read about Jesus yourself. So between August and and May of 2022, August of 2021 and May of 2022, we're going to provide a Bible study that walks you through a strategy for how to study the Bible, every eyewitness account of Jesus' life. We did Mark earlier this semester, and we are releasing Luke today because it's Advent. This is our spiritual journey towards Christmas. So I encourage you, if you're in the Word, if you're not in the Word, Read through Luke, through the Knowing Jesus Project available on our app because we can't live this out unless we are anchored in the Word. So that's like non-negotiable practice. And then just the question is, what do you need to practice? What do I need to practice? So I love you guys. I love God's Word. I love how relevant it is. And I love that He gives us some ways to fight against worry and anxiety. So I'm going to pray for us, that the Holy Spirit would show us exactly what to practice, and then we'll see you guys next week. So let's pray. Jesus, through your Holy Spirit, would you speak to every single one of us, show us what to practice, and give us the courage to do it. And it's in your unrivaled name we pray.